Welcome to another episode of the No Ceilings Podcast. I am Tyler Metcalf, joined as always by Tyler Rucker. Rucker only one time this week. How are we doing? Unbelievable. It's amazing how much more energy I have, Metcalf. But, you know, we're coming from you, uh, the No Ceilings Podcast feed. But we we had to bring it a guest on. Um, someone that's really close to us, you know, close to our heart. It only felt right that we we brought him on. So, Corey Toliba, how the heck are we? Oh, the... The audience, hear my voice two days in a row. Lucky them. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm terrific. I had my first um, like glass of water in like three days since I oh, have been exciting. to the pro day because I was just living off of coffee uh, instead. So my body is has thanked me today for you know Jealous. changing that up a little bit because it's just just been thriving and surviving on on coffee. Um, since I had to uh, fly Frontier and my flight got delayed about 45 different times. So um, oh, shout I'm out happy Frontier. to be back and I'm happy to be on the No Ceilings feed. Cool. Wait, I also heard, um, before we get into this madness, I also heard a rumor on the streets that you had Chick-fil-A breakfast for the first time. Can you, the, the people want to know, is that a true statement or is that fake it, news? No, it is a true statement. Um, wow. I, I get Chick-fil-A for lunch uh, probably like three times a week. I am a an avid Chick Fil A um, enthusiast, but I f- well one after the pandemic, uh, my local Chick Fil A stopped serving breakfast, okay. so they would only open for lunch. Okay. Over the last few months, they have started opening up a little bit earlier, and they are serving breakfast. But I guess I just can't shake the you know spicy chicken sandwich uh deluxe you know i need that pepper jack cheese and um so for the first time i had a chick-fil-a breakfast sandwich uh just a you know chicken sandwich on a biscuit it was phenomenal which you know i would expect nothing less from you know chick-fil-a because it's you know it's as, as far as uh food goes they're terrific don't don't love some of the other stuff with them but you know <laughs> they're just you know very nice people who work at the establishment and they they cook really good chicken sandwiches if you if you had to have the breakfast on a big board, where where is he going in the lottery or is it late first round sleeper? Big board as far as like fast food breakfast. Just, um, just throw me a number wherever is hitting in your head right now, whatever feels right. Something that's gonna make you sleep good at night. I mean, it's probably it's gotta be a top seven pick. Okay. As far as fast food goes. Um I would put it right up there as far as breakfast stuff goes with like Burger King's French toast sticks. Oh, wow. Okay. Now we're getting weird. We're getting real crazy. Yeah. Metcalf take over before we get out of control. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, so, so someone else who is, uh, you know, a, a, probably at least going to be a top seven pick is Amen Thompson, who what a Coy, transfer. He, <laughs> up close and personal. <laughs> what a um, transition. This guy's electric. <laughs> Well, and and Coy just got to see him up close at uh, Overtime Elite's Pro Day uh, earlier this week down in Atlanta. Who Coy was in the building. That's why he's here. So, Coy, we're going to dive into what we thought. Or Rucker and I were able to watch on YouTube, um, which was an experience. Um, but you were there. So before we get into kind of breaking down the the minutia of all these of all these prospects. What was your kind of big t- big picture takeaway and impression of the overtime elite experience? I um, I'm all in on it. I think it's just a phenomenal program. And uh, if I'm going to be honest, I think that I was a little skeptical of the longevity of it up until the NIL stuff changed. I think that changed the game for the overtime elite. Um where now they are getting these legitimately great young top of the class high school prospects in their gym, really, really young, letting them keep their college eligibility, which I think with these NIL rules is something that's important for these kids. Um, And they're getting them with amazing coaching in an amazing facility. I mean, you know, when you walk in, 
you uh, you see their their main court that they play on. I, I mean, it's it's looks like a you know almost like a movie set. How it's it's a project uh, production studio and a basketball court. Like it's just per- it's a beautiful design, um, beautiful layout. It's small and intimate, but it makes it feel large. Um, and then when you go downstairs, they have tremendous practice facilities. You know, they uh, have chefs for these kids they have you know uh, a gym for them to actually work out you know they have everything that you need and you know some of the kids um live near the facility in like apartments and then some of them you know you have the option obviously of having your family there and living with your family so they're getting this uh unbelievable experience that they're learning from you know and playing against really talented people from a really young age every day and it's a family and it's competitive and again they're getting great coaching uh and the league is expanding you know it, last year it was the same three teams and they're playing against each other they played a couple of exhibitions right but it was just the same three teams playing each other and it, it's hard from an evaluation standpoint for guys like us that's hard to evaluate the league has now expanded to six teams and they're playing way more um competition way more exhibitions they went overseas right to you know play mega and and some of these other you know international teams they played against you know brawny and cam boozer and other elite you know young prospects so i think the direction and the trajectory you know i I think uh they're gonna they want to continue expanding adding more teams to the league and you know i think like last year the games were broadcast on youtube right they were just put on youtube they weren't Mm -hmm. they weren't broadcast they were on youtube like 24 to 48 hours later and you know from everything i gathered it seemed like what i was like well where are you gonna do like live games eventually and they're like that's the idea and i was like well where are the live games gonna be like are you doing twitch youtube whatever and they're like for now i'm gonna tell you youtube that's all i'm gonna say and i'm like all right so you guys are trying to get a you're in the works for some kind of media rights deal. So yeah. I think the exposure that these kids are going to start getting outside of just being like social media stars, because obviously you can't beat their social media team, right? That like, that is a powerhouse. These kids are building a following at such a young age. So you add to the fact that they're going to be, I think, I don't know where they're going to be getting their games broadcast, but it's going to be on a larger platform than just throwing it on YouTube in you know, not even necessarily always having the full clip. So the growth that I think I've seen from year one to now, similar maybe to no ceilings, uh, has been a tremendously positive uh, thing. And I like I, I was very impressed by the entire uh, the entire day that I was there and the facilities and the players and, and everything they have planned. I think it's uh, an unbelievable thing. You know, like I it's a league. For sure, that's that's what they want to be known as. They want to be known as a league, but it almost feels like there are similarities to some of these, um, like clubs overseas that are like academies for young kids that are building, you know, kids to be professionals, right? And that that's what it feels like when you're there. Except they're playing in a you know a, a league that is going to continue to build out. So I tremendously impressed by it. So kind of going forward, obviously, this is only their second year. So, you know, they can still be pretty flexible in what direction they want to go down long term strategy wise. But the NIL rule changes with college basketball really did change things. And it did seem like this year they kind of pivoted more towards getting a lot of these really talented 15, 16, 17 year old kids who aren't going straight into the NBA after one season. So just a hunch. Do you see them kind of pivoting more or continuing towards this college alternative where they can pay players and they're acting more as a minor league system for the NBA? Or do you think that they may even just pivot more towards becoming one of the elite kind of prep organizations that is rivaling uh, Montford or IMG and they're building up these high school players to get them ready for whether they end up going to college or pros or overseas or whatever? I, I think that's they're already kind of trending there. Like they have classes that they like uh, the kids that are there, they have core classes that, that they have to take, you know, to like graduate school. But then like 
as far as like electives would go, they have like this program set up to where they can kind of prepare them for all these different opportunities that they would have, you know, at, at the next level, be it G League, international, NBA, whatever it is. So I, they're already setting that kind of stuff up because, yeah, you know, you have to realize like some of these kids that I saw, they're not draft eligible until 2026. Yeah. You know, if they're going to be there the whole time, right, they're going to be learning and soaking in so much information and by the time they get out they should be fully prepared for whatever that next step is so i think they're already doing that if there are you know more thompson twins out there i don't think they are going to be like no you can't play here you know i think until the nba gets rid of the one and done rule i think they're going to still be looking for that talent if it's out there but i do think that they have made a concerted effort with guys like Bryson Tiller and Nas Cunningham of, you know, really going after these highly recruited prospects and, um, you know, they've nabbed them. So I think you're going to start seeing like a guy like Bryson Tiller, who is ranked fifth overall in the top, you know, his class right now, I think when he gets a little bit more exposure and just being through this process, you know, I know, somebody there told me like as soon as Kevin Ollie saw him, he was like, what's he ranked six? Like, nah, that's too low. And like, he's probably right. But it's like when people see it, I think it like you're going to start seeing these guys rise up in their rankings in their class. And I think that's going to help them continue to get more prospects like that. And I, I think they're just going to dominate that space eventually. All right. Well, well let's kind of transition into, takeaways from these players that you were courtside watching um rucker and i were able to watch on youtube but we were only allowed to see what they showed us in that moment so you know our takeaways are probably a lot different um let, let's start off with Amen thompson who listeners of the draft act podcast know you're a little skeptical or maybe not all the way bought in um so what was your kind of big picture takeaway with him um you know i think one just from like a you know, a work ethic standpoint from a professionalism standpoint. Uh, you know, he, he was impressive during interviews. Uh, I think he's, you know, a great kid with a, a good head on his shoulders, you know, after um, the five on five scrimmages, they, all the kids came over and shook every person's hand that was there in like the front row. Like he came right up to everybody shook everyone's Smart. hand like they're very respect yeah they're like i said they're doing a great job of, yeah. of doing even the little things like that and um so just from that perspective like he's very locked in as he's working and um you know obviously he's a sick athlete and you know he stands out athletically even you know with some of these other kids that are there uh, some of which i'm sure we're going to talk about tonight so I, I but you know it's still hard you know it's it's like on one hand when they played mega, he was excellent, you know? So on the other hand, he's still going to be kind of older for his class playing against, you know, ultimately he's going to be playing against Bryson Tiller, who's class he's, he's draft eligible in 2026, you know? So it's, it's still going to be a hard evaluation for these kids because they're super athletic. They work really hard. They're clearly talented, but they still have holes in their games. And, you know, I, I still saw those holes while they're there but they're working and they're getting that good coaching that I talked about earlier. So um, I'm not going to say that like I'm any higher or lower on them after seeing them necessarily, mm -hmm. because for me, it's just still going to be about like, all right, I, whether you're shooting around or you're doing a drill, like I want to see what you look like in game action. So until we, you know, they get into their game schedule and we could see what he looks like after 25 games, where's the shot then? I'm not necessarily concerned fully about it now. Obviously, he's felt a little bit more comfortable, I think, this year comparatively to last year with his shot. But there's still moments where he's not comfortable or he's overthinking. Like, you know, I saw uh, during one of the 4v4v4s during the scrimmage, uh, they were icing him and pushing him to the corner and he ended up shooting the mid range shot was, which was encouraging. Cause I think that was an area of his game that he just was almost unwilling to engage in last year, but you could see the thought process behind it. He didn't 
really like recognize the timing of when he should be shooting it when he had the most space versus when they were going to be able to close out on him. So there's still that kind of stuff that he's working on, but it's clear that they have that plan for him and are telling him to work on these things. So like I was encouraged by the fact that he looks like he was a little bit more willing to experiment because in that episode of the draft act, I said, I don't care if he misses a hundred three point shots. I just want him to feel confident shooting them. Yep. You know, that, that being okay with failure is how you get better, not hiding that weakness. And I don't think he's hiding it. I think he's willing to shoot through the, uh, those misses now. So uh, that's that's the impression that I got. It's not that his shot looked better. I still have concerns about his shot. It's not he's not at the point right now where I would feel comfortable with him as you know the third pick in the draft. But the fact that he is willing to miss now is something that I think is growth. So from that, I guess I would say I'm, I feel more confident in his evaluation from that perspective, but I still want to see how he grows through the year before I you know, make any kind of definitive um, ranking on where I would have him. Rucker, based on what you saw, was there anything that looked different or got you really excited or even raised new questions with a man? I had about five questions I wanted to ask Corey and he pretty much just answered every one of them in that rant, which was just, beautiful so thanks a lot now i have to kind of think on the fly but my watching him in he's the one i'm puzzling about and, and metcalf me and you have talked about this on the on the pod plenty of times like when i have a player like this i'm not going to put him up there just because of the consensus like i have to go see them in person and that's why i was so excited to get Corey on this episode is because i usually see eye to eye with a lot of you guys on no ceilings and I wanted to hear about the man Thompson because he's, he's getting a lot of buzz as the potential third overall pick. Um, I think a lot of us at no ceilings have some different opinions about that, but I'm still confused. I, I I'm still got a lot of questions and they're probably not going to be answered until I get to see him in game reps. Like Corey's saying, I feel like impressing at a pro day, that's sometimes predetermined and you know what you're going to be going through is one thing, but seeing it in the game is, is another. Um, Corey, I guess my only question for you is last year, you know, with the overtime elites, their first year, John Montero was the big name prospect and, and our common theme with scouting Montero. And I think NBA scouts were this way. It was what's the competition like? When I watch Thompson, I know they have way better talent this year. There's no denying that. But is this just the best talent that still looks just so like more mature and athletically advanced compared to the competition? Or is this a legit talent? Like, is this a legit NBA guy that's going to transfer and dominate athletically? Because there's no doubt when he gets a, you know, a clear lane, he's freakish in the air. But I keep watching and I'm like, am I, is this fool's gold or is this legit? If that makes sense. Yeah. I, and I think the answer is probably going to be somewhere in the middle uh, as far as this experience. Cause like you said, there's no doubt the talent is better this year. You know, right. obviously they have a carryover of a lot of the guys, but they've gotten a lot of talented kids um, throughout this program that he's going to be going up against. And, you know, it's hard because these kids, I think, are all like some of these kids, I think, are going to be the same caliber of prospects they are, but they're behind developmentally, you know, physically, as far as their game goes, the talent's there, but he's just a little older, a little bit more, you know, uh, developed as, as far as that goes. So it is hard. Cause I do think that part of him maybe, you know, looking like a standout in certain situations is going to be that. But like I said, he played really well against mega. He played well in his internet against international competition. That is, the, the kind of environment where you would want to see him and kind of, you know, evaluate him versus his peers. And he still stood out, you know, he still had those same concerns. The, sh you know, the, the three point shooting wasn't great, but he got to the line and he knocked down his free throws. So I wish there were more of that kind of context to evaluate against. And, you know, it's unfortunate. I think that, you know, there's not, but he is going to be playing better talent. I think overall than he played last year. And, um, like I said, I think the coaches are doing the right things. Like I really do like in, 
the um the drill portions you know one of the things that they were showing it's like i i know metcalf i think this is one of your concerns as well that that i share like all right once he gives the ball up what is he doing yeah right like because we know he's a great playmaker he is a genuinely right. very good passer and obviously he he showed off a little bit of that uh you know throughout the pro day but what is he going to do when he doesn't have the ball in his hands because if you're going to be the third pick you know maybe you're going to houston are you taking the the ball out of Jalen Green's hands? Maybe, but probably not. Jalen Green's going to be a third year player at that point, who's you know going to be in the year where most players explode. Are you taking the ball out of Cade's hands? Are you going to take the ball out of Paulo and Franz's hands? Like, no, right? You're not. So, what are you going to do without it? And you know, so they're focusing on things like that in you know what they're working on the drills. Like a lot of the drills were all right. We're going to come off the screen. You're going to make that weak side hit but now you're going to come and relocate. You're not just going to stand still. You were going to relocate to a spot. And, you know, in the 4v4v4, because I think you said that they cut the the scrimmages off, right? They cut, it was just yeah, the like, 4v4v4s. Yeah, yeah it was, it was like halfway awesome. through. It was, we love the know, overtime elite, but that was great. Like, I love, a, I love a good 4v4v4, but it's also not the best, um, you know, thing to show Amen and Asar's physical talents because there's less up and down because you already have a defense waiting on the other side, right? Um, but so I saw in some of the 4v4, which I was excited to watch them in that context because it was like, all right, well, what do you look like in this half-court setting? And there were times where it took Amen a second to realize I just gave the ball up and now I actually have to move and get to a spot. So there was a hesitation, but there was a recognition that that was the next step because you you know you could do a drill, but then doing it at game speed during the competition when you have a million things going on around you that you have to think about is different. So, but they're working on it, and he's cognizant of it. Um, so I, I think that's more so than looking at the talent this year. I think it's going to be looking at the nuance that he's working on against that talent is how I would recommend like viewing it from an evaluation standpoint. And, and for everyone listening, it's not like we're ripping on a men Thompson. Like we're all fans. We're just intrigued. And I think this is becoming the most fascinating part of the draft cycle. It's so early, but we almost weirdly feel like we know the first two picks. So we're like, who's third. We have to yeah. look, like start looking at that through a microscope right now. And Thompson's getting all the buzz. He's a, highlight machine but there's a lot of questions still and and don't get me wrong there's a world right like there's a world yeah. where he's the okay, third yeah. pick because it's 100 because one of the things one of the things he showed in the the scrimmage was that like he competes defensively yeah you know he gets after it there was a point in the scrimmage where um he was guarding i want to say bryce warren who was bringing the ball up for the young dreamers and he was hounding him Right. And Bryce Warren's a good player. I saw him not only at the pro day, I saw him play in New Jersey a couple of weeks ago and um, he was hounding him and he made him pick up his dribble basically at half court. Like he was turning him and he basically like Bryce Warren, he swarmed him to the point where Bryce Warren basically like fell on the ground. And then Amen was like talking shit to him while he was on the ground. And like, obviously this is probably his boy out of, you know, that context. Um, but it was also like, Hey, like we're playing right now. There are NBA scouts in front of me and I'm going for your jugular. So like you saw that competitive nature and you saw what he could do defensively too. So he is very much still as much as I want to say, you know, I have some, I still have concerns about his offensive game. He still showed a, a ton of stuff that you were like, Hey, I get it. If a team is like, I'm betting on him to be the third pick in the draft. Nick Metcalf, I'm going to throw you up for a curveball because you know everyone knows that you love this. Like we all know that about you. We but all know that. About you. Watching the pro day, Metcalf, we and you have talked about Thompson before. We've talked about him behind the scenes of our thoughts. Did you feel any different watching him? Are you intrigued by? Because you've also we've talked about his defense, and we said yeah. kind of we wanted to see if the motor stayed hot because it, when it turned off, it was like there's the questions, but he looked like he had the tools to be nasty. And that's where I think the area is, if that stays consistent, I'm, I would easily buy in on a man Thompson because the shot will always be something that needs work. But if he unlocks another like potentially elite skill like that, yeah, okay. Like I, I'll feel better about the, the shot needing to be a loading process if you want to put it that way. Yeah. And I, I've always really liked his on-ball defense. Um, you know, we 
the competitiveness that Corey just mentioned, we saw that a lot when he would, you know, be the point of attack defender, especially last year when like he would defend his brother and like they would go at it because, you know, they're competitive. They're not going to want the other brother to one up them. Um, So I I feel like the on ball stuff has always been really consistent and really impressive because of his footwork, his length, his competitiveness. Uh, The off ball stuff still kind of has me worried Um, whenever a shot goes up and he just watches it and doesn't box out and just uses his pure explosiveness to potentially get a rebound. But I mean, he gets back cut a ton, gives up offensive rebounds a lot. Um, Offensively, based on my, you know, vantage point, a lot of it looked the same. So my feelings on this weren't really changed. Um, It's encouraging to hear Corey, who was, you know, right there, say that he was at least processing how he needed to move off ball and relocate after giving the ball up because that stuff's really important and it's something he's going to have to learn. So I think Corey, in my, my last question on his offense is that off ball relocation, do you think it's something that kind of eventually comes naturally to him or did it feel like it was the flavor of the week and it was something that his coaches had just been stressing to him and he was like all right i i have a lot of eyes on me there are a lot of people in the building i have to show this off and you know maybe two weeks from now we see less of it no i think it's real i I think again i really buy into the coaching staff they have there the player Mm -hmm. development team that they have there like outside of the fact that the three teams have three great coaches and you know i'm sure eventually i'm going to once i feel like a ryan gomes stan i'm sure i'm going to be you know singing his praises at some point but they have three great great coaches and then you know uh kevin ollie who is basically like the player development guy for who runs you know the the whole development for the program um oversees kind of everything and works with all of the teams so it's basically i think it's like individual workouts in the morning and coach ollie is there um working with those guys and then at night they go and and practice with their teams kind of separately uh so I, i i have full faith that the coaching is going to emphasize the things that it needs to emphasize they have a film room like they're they're doing their thing from from that aspect they're putting these kids in position to become the best players they can you know it, it's not Amen thompson's fault that you know when he signed on to this thing the nil rule wasn't in place and he wanted to get paid for what he felt like he was worth mm-hmm. as an amateur athlete like that's awesome and he in a lot of ways was like a trailblazer for that um so yeah, like he's more ta- he might be more talented than a lot of the competition, but it's not his fault he's more talented. So I I do think that I saw the right things from him. And yeah, okay. like you know, the shot. You want me to nitpick it? Obviously, it's a little palmy. His footwork is a little fidgety and choppy. He, you know, um still kind of overthinks uh, about shooting instead of just letting it fly. But as we mentioned, he's letting it fly a little bit more often. He's okay in learning how to fail in that context. If you can feel comfortable learning how to fail and being okay missing shots in front of 25 NBA teams and, you know, media and scouts, then you'll probably be okay doing it when you're just playing, you know, a random game with an audience, you know, in front of you. So I, I think that these things that he's learning and that he's trying to emphasize that he showed in the pro day, I do think it's going to stick, but it's a process and it's just going to take a little bit of time for it to become a little bit more natural for him. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. And look, I, I think one of the other cool things that they did is they didn't have Amen and Asar on the same team when they were running drills. Right. And, um, because they wanted Asar to have the ball in his hands and show his capabilities there. So I'm also hoping that, they give other guys on ball reps to allow him to not have always have the ball in his hands in preparation for the fact that, you know, even if he is the third pick again, he's probably not going to be having the ball in his hands too often. So I, I think that they also have that idea in mind that, all right, I'm in, he's the guy, he's going to be a high usage guard in this context, but also let's try to get him some, different looks eventually when they go to five on five. So he doesn't have to bring the ball up the court every single time. Well, uh, I think that's a good spot to pivot to his brother, 
Massar, who is the second biggest name, um, you know, in the overtime elite program. Uh, Asar has been battling some kind of nagging injuries recently. Yeah. Um, from all I was able to see, it looked like he participated in some drills, didn't play in the 4v4 before. Um, what were your thoughts on him? Um, so he did participate in the the 4v4v4s. Um, he did part, okay. they had like multiple groups for each team. Uh, and then he did participate in the scrimmages. So I, I think that, you know, he was definitely dealing with something because, you know, in this context for somebody who's that athletic, right. You want to show these NBA scouts, how athletic you looked. And you could tell like when he was going through some of the drills, he was not trying to like jump through the roof, you know? And, and so that was, uh, I think a consequence of him, you know, playing a little bit banged up, you know, he missed the game earlier, um, you know, last week, uh, where, you know, with Bronny and, um, the Kentucky kid that I'm blanking on his name who went viral. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he, like he missed that, that stuff. So, uh, he was definitely dealing with that stuff, but, uh, I will say I was higher on, I left higher on his jumper than Amen's. You're speaking my language. Please, please keep talking. Don't stop. <laughs> yeah. Hey, look, don't, get me, don't get me wrong. I wasn't like, you know, who's going to be the best shooter in the class. <laughs> Sorry, <Tom. laughs> you know, that's, that's definitely not uh, how I left, but I was like, you know what? Like it looks a little bit more fluid now. Like when he's, I th- like there's nitpicky stuff. Like I think his, his footwork is probably a little bit less consistent than Amen's is. Um, he still is a little pommy as well. But I also thought that, um, you know, when he was like shooting turnaround fadeaways and stuff like that, like it just looked like a fluid, like shot that you would see from one of these like early 2000s, like athletic scoring guards. Um, So I was a little bit encouraged with that. And it's like, obviously, the more reps you get, the better. Uh, I think that he, he had one move, which I'm going to post to the no ceilings, you know, uh, TikTok and YouTube shorts and stuff where he like went through the lane and hit a Euro step for a finish at the rim. And I was like, Whoa, that was super smooth because I think a lot of the Tom's, a lot of the times, sometimes I, I see the Thompson twins and their athleticism. And it's obvious. It's like so fast that like there it's missing like a smoothness. Yes. You know, it's not that it's not impressive. It's not that it's less, effective it just doesn't look as like aesthetically pleasing as maybe like cam whitmore like gliding through people because he's very light on his feet but asar made one move through the 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 lane and euro stepped and i was like that's what i wanted to see that's that smoothness that i see so um you know he he too obviously the jumper is going to be the big question with him but i i think i'm a little bit higher on his jumper uh you know he they put the ball in his hands a lot in these drills. That's why they separated Amen and Asar in the four v four v fours. They they played together in the five uh, five v fives. So um, I I think you know he has some decision making stuff to work on when he does have the ball in his hands a little bit more. You know uh, I think when he was getting doing interviews um, after the the pro day with with media, you know he had mentioned that you know they kind of both played with the ball in their hands and then eventually Amen just kind of took over. So he had, he learned how to be more of a scorer, but he always kind of had that. But so I, I think that, you know, he's going to um, have opportunities to work through some of the on ball stuff this year again. And, and obviously he, they, they played on two separate teams last year. So he got the opportunity to show a little bit last year as well. I think that's the area of growth for him. Like, all right, can you facilitate a little bit? like uh like amen like that's and i think he's capable he he definitely has some has showed some passing flashes it's just i think he's less of a decision maker right now than amen is because he doesn't have the same reps but i i saw some really impressive stuff and then there was some stuff that i was like yeah that you know what i kind of what i expected from a guy who you know is nursing an injury rucker when Corey mentioned asari's shot you you perked up quite a bit I, I, for as confused as I've been with the men, I've been like three times as confused with the SAR because I feel like I'm maybe the biggest believer 
because in I'm trying I'm not trying to be like, oh, I'm the guy, the only one that believes in him, but I feel like the difference isn't that massive. A lot of people have one like going third, one going late, late lottery. And I'm like, I don't know if it's that different. Like there's some stuff with the star I'm really, really encouraged by. I weirdly could see down the road, he ends up in a better situation that will be patient with him and allow him to develop. And he has like the longer career and longer success because he might not, you know, Asar might be the third pick or excuse me, a man might be the third pick and be like, okay, there's all these lofty expectations. Now Asar might go to a team that's in a little bit better situation and the shot needs to work, but he can come in and contribute and get some early confidence. I don't know. I just, just watching his shot in that pro day, there was some, some instances where I was like, this isn't as bad as I was thinking it was going to be. There's still some ugly stuff, but I, I was encouraged and, and I'm just really, really intrigued to watch him. Like I, I'm already planning to go see a couple of their games, but he, the Thompson twins for, for different reasons. I'm just, I have to go see them in person because that's what we talk about. Like scouting and watching on film. You can only see so much. You got to see them in person. That's why, you know, I'm jealous that Corey got to see him, but I'm just, I'm excited to hear that because there's stuff with his game that, I think needs more love, needs more attention. But I feel like everyone is just so quick to be like, oh, shot's way, way worse. And I'm like, yeah, but he does some some nice stuff on the court too. And I think he's got touch around the basket. I think he's got some some good finishing ability. I, I, I just also the court, the part that Corey brought up about like the smoothness, it stood out to me with Asar. A man's just a freak. Like when he gets a driving lane, you could tell he just lights up from the three-point line. And he's like, well, you know, take off here we go i feel like asar has a little bit of swagger a little bit of wiggle when it comes to driving through traffic at times i might be crazy though and that won't be the first time so i know it, it's in that it's inevitable that these guys are going to get compared to each other a ton and a man has been getting more of the hype than asar but Corey, watching them up close was there anything that asar did that kind of really stood out to you that over like overwhelmingly more impressive than what Amen does. I don't think overwhelmingly. I, again, sure. I, you know, he wasn't a hundred percent. Yeah. Physically. So, um, you know, it's hard to get a, a, a fully clear picture again. I think his jumper might be at least aesthetically a little bit more pleasing to look at, even though he still has some of those things that he needs to work on. But I, I think one of the points that, that Rucker made that, is one of the reasons why like I don't have them in two different tiers like some people do is that I think that Asar might have um, less of a transition from what his game is going to be from this level to the NBA level where he could play similarly. And again, like I'm in, like I'm not saying like if you're, if a team's drafting him early, they're going to want to put the ball in his hands some, right? Um, but let's say he goes to Detroit. Like you have Jaden Ivey, and Cade Cunningham. So you're, he's going to have to find ways to operate and learn to live without the ball. Asar is already going to be there. You know, he's already going to know how to play without it. You know, this isn't Scoot where wherever Scoot goes, he is the guy. He is ha yeah. he has the ball in his hands. It does not matter who is there. He's the dude. You know, wherever Victor goes, it doesn't matter if somehow, you know, everybody got hurt on Cleveland and they won the lottery. If Victor goes to Cleveland, sorry, Evan Mobley, Victor's the guy, <laughs> you know, like I'm in, I don't know if he's the guy, no matter where he goes, certainly in some places. Mm -hmm. Right. But if he goes to Indiana, you're not going to take the ball out of Tyrese Halliburton's hands. Right. Like, so the NBA is so talented now. They're so talented that it's really hard to take that spot. And I think for Asar, the, just the one thing, I just think he's going to have, a smoother transition with roles versus Amen. And it's not to say that Amen is not going to be like, maybe he transitions seamlessly. There's it's not to say he can't because um, he's a bright kid who works hard. And I think he'll figure that out for sure. And I think with, with both of them, you know, the one thing you got to look at, like look at the success that a guy like Jaden Ivy has had early on athletically, like they're every bit, the athlete, that Jaden Ivey is right. Like Jalen green, like they're going to be able to get to their spots with the NBA spacing. 
Um, so they're still going to be effective. I just think if I was picking one thing for Asar as a reason to like buy in a little bit, it's because his role is probably going to be a little bit more similar. All right. Well, there are a couple other guys who are 2023 eligible, like Jesse and Gortman, uh, Bryce Griggs, um, Devonte Cobbs. Did any of them really kind of stand out or make an impression with you? Um, based on what I saw, I thought Gortman looked really intriguing. Um, I thought Griggs, um, it looked like he got in significantly better shape and I yeah. thought he was, he was more impressive. Uh, he, you know, honestly, he was one of my least favorite watches last year and during these scrimmages, I was like, Oh, okay. He looks better. He looks in better shape. He looks more under control. So I, I, out of any of those other names for 2023, were you intrigued by any of them? Um, I'm intrigued by Greg's for sure. Like you said, like he's in phenomenal shape, you know, um, he was asked um, at the interviews after like, you know, wh what, how did his, he handle his body transformation uh, transformation. And, you know, he said like, basically I got feedback last year from NBA executives at the pro day, like that I got to get in better shape. Right. Like, and so this summer he really just, I think he became a professional and I think it goes across the board, whether it was maybe he's, you know, watching film and, you know, just treating himself as a pr the professional that he is. And he got himself in phenomenal shape. Like he looked, he looked great. So I'm definitely in intrigued by him. Um, Jay Gort, uh, I'm intrigued by just on the fact that they call him category six as his nickname. Cause he's, you know, like a, a disruptor and, um, that is incredible. It's a phenomenal, it's a phenomenal that's, nickname. That's, that's a and, nickname. uh, you know, I, I saw Bryce, and um jay gord and, and those guys the, in the cold hearts team uh in new jersey play against some of the you know best high school talent in the region uh in the northeast region uh which you know included a guy like sim wilcher who's headed to unc um you know some other guys were going to big time school so like you know they were playing against good competition in actual game setting outside of just this pro day scrimmaging so i've you know, have a good feel for them. And I thought that Bryce, you know, like his shot, it's got to be there. You know, he's got to be efficient, but I think he's a great playmaker who has a really smart IQ. And it's funny in one of the drills um, that they were doing early on, he was on the left side and he had a couple of finishes that he finished with his right hand. And I was like, uh, we, we got to get you finishing with your left hand there because when the defender comes, you're not going to actually be able to finish that way. And then in the scrimmage, he basically made the same move and smoothly finished with his left hand. Mm. And I was like, I love that. Like he noticed, yes. he knew the situation and he adjusted in an actual simulated game situation in the scrimmage. So uh, he's definitely a guy to watch again. He's going to be a hard evaluation. I feel like he's going to be yeah. a similar evaluation to like Montero where it's like competition level. He's been in this program now for the second year. You know, he's a veteran but he's taken it seriously and um, he's definitely, I think improved from last year to this year, just from his, his feel for the game to um, you know, just his, how he's handling his, his business on the court. So I, I think there's, you're definitely going to continue to see growth. Um, Jay Gort, you know, I, I think he's a guy that right now I'm probably a little bit lower on. He has all the tools. He's got a smooth shot. Um, seems like a good kid, good head on his shoulders, but I've, I think that he, so far he's impressed me more in a workout setting than the actual game like situations. Mm, okay. So uh, not to say that you know their season hasn't started yet. So it's not like, I'm like, Hey, I'm out on this kid. Cause mm -hmm. I see him working and he's got some real tools physically, but he is, you know, a little bit on the shorter side for, you know, the, and the NBA is trending away from that. I, I think if this was a conversation we were all having six years ago, you know, it'd be a different conversation for a lot of these guys, but um, you know, he's a guy I want to see more of, and I'm interested to see his, his growth and his trajectory this year because he's all these kids are working. So I, I'm not concerned about the working and, and the, the lack of effort They're They're trying to get better every day, but uh, I want to see him in more game like situations. Cause the other thing is you cannot form a full complete evaluation on the fact that I saw him live once you know, a couple of weeks ago. And then I saw him at a pro day. 
I, you, you need to continue to watch more. Otherwise you're not, you're getting an incomplete, you know, picture. So uh, that's where I'm at with, with those two guys. Rucker, what about you? You, you had been texting me on the side about Gortman. Um, did you have any kind of really fascinating takeaways from these guys or just more so interest is a little more peaked than it was before? Yeah, I would say the interest is just a little bit more peaked. It, Gorman just, you know, um, we got to be better about this Metcalf. So he's, he's listed at 6'2", about 172 pounds. He had a reported plus seven wingspan before the pro day, which yeah. got everyone in their feelings. But he just made a couple plays during drills and 4v4, and I was just kind of like, okay, there's some smoothness. There's some shiftiness there. But it, going into this year, you kept hearing about the Thompson twins as the overtime elite guys to watch out with. And then it was Jay Gort. Like, that's the other wild card to keep an eye on. So I think with with seeing him now, I was like, I get why people were intrigued with him. But now I need to see more. Like, now you you got my curiosity. Now you have my attention. Like, so I want to just get in person, see what else he can do. This is one of those guys like preseason, you get my attention. Now I want to see how you develop and progress throughout the entire season. But for now, like I, I would need to see a lot, lot more. Um, it's just a like, Corey brings up a great point. Shocker. Like the, the league is trending away from this. So if you're going to be that undersized ball handler, you got to do a lot to get teams to invest their trust with you. All right. Well, I, you know, Corey throughout this last week has been texting us uh, in the group chat about how intrigued he was with some of these younger guys who weren't 2023 yes. eligible. So there are a lot of names that I know really made an impression um, and a lot of names that a lot of people who really pay attention to the recruiting stuff will recognize. So, Corey, I, I'm just going to let you kind of freestyle who who made the biggest impression on you. Um. Well, so the biggest impression on me and i only say this because it was the first time i saw him in person because i saw uh bryson tiller and nas cunningham in person uh, a couple of weeks ago those are the other two guys i'll i'll talk about but the guy who made um the biggest impression on me was jakai howard Ooh, okay so sell me on jakai howard sell me this pen mr draft yeah. deck so jakai howard you know you we say that like the the thompson twins are these generational unbelievable athletes my man ja howard is right there really this kid's bounce is crazy man like i'm talking his head is above the rim he doesn't have the same quick twitch first step burst that the thompsons have but it would not shock me if his he had more bounce like i was like yo <laughs> this kid and and then i was like um all right well like how old is he you know he's draft class of 2025 he's listed at six, he's last uh listed at six six in the program that they gave us and i feel like he was every bit the same size as the thompsons like he i mean if this kid is what uh, a sophomore uh, yeah, in high 17. school, right? Like junior. I don't know. Like whatever he is, like he's super young. He still might be growing and what a smooth shooter. So it's like, we have questions about the Thompson's uh, shooting. Ja'Kai Howard, that kid aesthetically, that thing looks pretty. Like I wrote down in my notes, like Bradley Beal question mark. Like as far as like, that's what his shot preparation looked like. And here's the thing that I loved about him. And this is a nuance that you could only see in person. One of, one of the, the things that they do in, in these pro days with the coaches, the coaches are out there coaching these kids to talk on the floor. So, you know, when they're doing these shooting drills where they're like coming off movement and like, you know, um, fading to the corner, the coaches want them to scream like ball. Um, and I, he was the only one that I noticed that was actively doing that, not only in drills, but was doing it out on the floor in the four V four V four and the five on five scrimmages. So he's taking all of the little nuances that they're 
like something as little as just talking to communicate that you have an open shot. And he's executing that out already. Um, so developmentally, he's a sponge. I, I see what he's picking up and he's actually putting it into practice. A athletic gifts through the freaking roof. Competitive. Um, I was like, yo, this kid's got something serious. And like, I know that like, you know, he, he didn't have like the flashiest box score um, in the game against like Brawny and uh, Camboozer like that weekend, but he's younger. And I am so interested to see how he develops because I think he has real elite um, athletic tools to go with a really beautiful stroke. And so I'm going to be watching to see how his ball skills develop when he, you know, I think after the Thompson twins move on and he's actually given more on ball reps, I'm going to be interested to see how that plays out because it, he could be one of these guys who is like a, you know, potential 25 point per game scorer, super athletic, but he's also, you know, six, seven, you know, like, so that's super intriguing. So I wanted to start there just because it was new and fresh and I hadn't seen him in person. I had just seen, you know, the crazy dunks on like TikTok. Um Bryson Tiller is draft class 2026. I saw him. Yeah, that was wild when I looked that up. Cause I, I like... was convinced the whole time on the broadcast, they were lying and they kept me <laughs> in on him and his frame. And I was like, that is a grown ass man. That is not yeah. a 2026 prospect. So I um, was like, hey, real quick, hold on. Cause yeah. you brought up a great thing. That's really important. And I don't want us to forget about it about Howard. That's probably the most important thing I've heard this entire night. And I love talking with you guys, but NBA scouts, like for everyone listening to Corey's rant about like how Howard was a sponge and picking up and trying to do all the little nuances. You might not think that was a big detail. That is humongous for NBA scouts and executives. They light up when they see that, like that is the little stuff that makes a guy jump 15 spots on a board is because they're like, Hey, this kid wants to work. He's coachable. He's a quick learner and he's going to be a technician and a robot. So like from everything we talked about tonight, like that just sold me that sell me this pen that just sold me on Jakai Howard. And now I'm excited. And I also, while you were talking, had to remind myself of who that was. And yes, I know exactly who that was. I was like, who the hell is this kid? <laughs> oh, pretty. So, okay. All right. I just, that's a really important part. Cause like, it is. Go, why do they, why is this guy buzzing? And it's like, because that's the Intel. That's what you can't see sitting on your couch. That's what you can tell when you're in person and you're scouting live in the event. So thank you, Corey. I appreciate it. Now well, you, you know, that's, talk that's about the incredible you, Hulk. That's why, that's why you had me come on here to give you these, yeah, you these little details. And I yeah. think why you're emphasizing it is, you know, Met, Metcalf asked me earlier with Amen Thompson, do you think that he's going to be continue to put this stuff into practice outside of this pro day? And I do, but Ja'Kai Howard already is putting it into practice some of these yeah, things, that, right? That's awesome. Yeah, and it was really cool to see, um, especially because you know I work with kids these age, like I coach kids that are the same age as these kids, and I know how hard it is to get kids to do something as simple as that. Because when you're playing, you're not thinking about these little details, you know. When you're, and this is something um, that goes into. You know, and as we transition to Bryson Tiller, who is being coached by uh, Ryan Gomes, former Boston Celtic, you know, I had an opportunity to ha have a like a pretty decent discussion with him, um, and because I'm so impressed with the job that he's doing, and it's why another reason why I'm so excited about Bryson Tiller because he gets to learn under Coach Gomes this year. You know, it, it's really hard for high school kids who are bigger, stronger, faster, more athletic to all of a sudden have to pick up the details that they never had to worry about because they were always the best and head and shoulders above the competition. And now they're playing with their peers that are all, you know, in a similar talent level. And when they get to the next level, they might not be the most talented, bigger, biggest, strongest, fastest guy anymore. So that, you know, he's trying to get these kids to pick up the details. And I'm sure all the coaches are having those same conversations with their teams, right? So for Ja'Kai Howard to have pick that up and realize that, you know, one of the things I talked about with Coach Gomes was like, okay, what do you do when you're, because I was impressed because he's 
teaching these kids offensively and defensively. Defensively, these kids are in the right spot. If the low man needs to be at the hoop, he's there. You know, like he has the rotations. He's talking, you know, and he's like, he was telling me, he's like, you know, I'm, I was in so many situations in the NBA that I don't even have to see a kid on the other team play. If, if he, like, I could already tell what he's going to do just because I've seen the pattern so often in the NBA and I'm trying to teach that to these kids and I'm trying to teach them how to be effective both off of that and how to counter it, but at, you know, how to be effective no matter what the situation is, because you can, because I've seen all and been in all these situations and with the kids who are offensively, all right, you're on the weak side. Now you're used to having the ball in your hands. Well, are you going to stand still or are you going to find ways to be effective? Are you going to, you know, hammer out so you can get your guy an open look? Are you going to, you know, curl it? it, you know, like a guy like Mikael Bridges who spends a lot of time in the corner, he finds really opportunistic moments to when the defense falls asleep to just make that baseline cut and get easy looks. Right. You know, maybe he fakes like he's going to come off a handoff and he'll cut back like all these different things. And like, that's a point of emphasis. So when you pick up these little things, it's really encouraging. And that's why, you know, that little moment is something that Rooker wanted to emphasize with Ja'Kai Howard. Um, now on to Bryson Tiller. I, you know, I, I, you know, you hear the name, you see the lists. And then when I saw him in person in the game, uh, two weeks ago in New Jersey, I was like, Oh my God. <laughs> Cause you know, I would see him do some things baseline where I was like, can I trade uh, Patrick Williams for <laughs> Bryson Tiller right now? Cause they're the same exact size and same kind of player. And he, that's how ready he looks physically where like he looks like he could play in an NBA game yesterday. And he is a sophomore in high school, <laughs> you know, um, but beyond that, he is talented. He is uh, a worker. Like he's got a, a good head on his shoulders and he is getting coached by a good coach. This kid right now, he's ranked number five on the top 25 um, on ESPN's list. That is not going to be that way for long. This he's a sophomore. He's 6'9", 220 already. Like he might end up 6'10", 6'11". He said in the interviews afterwards that he watches guys like Kawhi and Giannis and like all of the guys that you want him to watch and learn from. That's who he's watching and picking up things for his game. And you could tell, I saw him in New Jersey, take a rebound, gobble up a rebound, rip it out of the air, take it coast to coast and throw like a tomahawk dunk on the other side. And again, this is against a uh, high level competition that are going to be d1 players like next year so man his potential is through the roof i think he's one of the better prospects that are you know in the high school circuit right now of any age at all and he's a guy that like hey i know that it's years away we're in the year 2022 he's not gonna be a he's gonna 2026 draft guy buy stock in bryson tiller right now because this kid is the goods he is the real deal Metcalf, what'd you think? Because the only thing I would say is I'm watching the pro day and Tiller comes on the screen. And and I Metcalf was texting me before and I was like, I'm watching without knowing anyone. I was like, I, I'll I'll figure out the names throughout because I was like, I want to see who pops. It's the best way to watch. Yeah, it's the situations. best way to pop. Because I was like, who stands out? All right, let me look them up. And Tiller, they zoom in on Tiller, and I'm like, who's this fucking kid? And then <laughs> They're like tw class of 2026. And I knew who Tiller was before, but I just hearing it and seeing it, you're like, oh my gosh, that's him. And they're interviewing a coach the whole time he's doing his little pro day workout. And the coach just could not stop raving about the type of kid he is, how mature he is, how serious he takes his body, how he's just like, just it handles himself the right way. He's there, like, he's mature beyond his years. He's taking himself so serious when it's like working on his body, working on his craft. And I was like giddy about talking about him. And I'm like, I'm watching him and I don't know him and I don't know anything about him. And I see how special he looks. And then you, you keep hearing the 2026. I'm like, you guys are lying. There's no way. Cause he's listed at six, nine to 15 or something I'm like bullshit. Where's the other 40 pounds? <laughs> Cause he's just ripped, but he's, um, he looks, and it's more like, impressive in person. And his body, his physique is more impressive in person, man. Like, and, and that's why I'm so excited about the overtime program and circling back to one of the first questions you asked, like, you know, how do you, what was your impression bringing in kids like this? Yeah. It's and impossible. Getting them in, like it's and one year, the, the jump they made 
is ridiculous. It's, it, I mean, a kid like this, that's a get, man. This kid is the, he's a, he is the real deal. He's a big time. Like when they look back, it's going to be like, oh, Bryson Tiller, who, you know, I think has the potential to probably be in, you know, a, a multi-time all-star down the line. He was a part of the overtime elite program. That's going to be a recruiting tool, a selling point. You know what I mean? And, um, the same thing with Nas Cunningham, you know, Nas Cunningham is, you know, depending where you look, either the number one prospect or like number three prospect in his class, they got him. And I'll tell you my favorite thing that, uh, I saw from Nas Cunningham, cause this is a guy that I look at offensively and I go, you know what? He might be what we wanted Amani Bates to be. Ooh, and I was really excited to ask you about Cunningham more than anyone. So here we are. Here, but I'll tell you my here. favorite nugget because it's not offensively. So I'm right in front of him because I'm down by his section because they're doing these, um, you know, a lot the the four v four v fours. Like the, we were able allowed to pretty much move around wherever we wanted. We're sitting courtside, but they're like you can sit on whatever section. The world is yours. Like the overtime people were the best. Like wherever you want to go, get your content, like go get it. So I'm on one side of the court and he's got a mismatch with a bigger guy. Right. And he's, he's defending him. And the guys in the post is like, he's telling him, he's like, you can't guard me. And he's like, he's like, this is, this is a mismatch. He's like, you can't guard me, but he doesn't have the ball. So he's right in front of me. Say, he's saying this to Nas and Nas, every time he said that, he's like, all right, call for the ball then. He's like, call for it then. He's like, you won't call for it. Call for the ball. I'm, it's a mismatch. Call for the ball then. And he wasn't calling for the ball. And then eventually the ball swung to him in the post. And this is a guy that's got a, he probably had, you know, 40, 50 pounds on Nas Cunningham, who was a young kid who hasn't you know filled out and grown into his body yet, but has a good frame. And he's just battling with him. And he forces him into a tough shot. And he gets it. And he's like, yeah, like you ain't shit. Like he's talking to him like confident. And like, this is a kid who obviously not afraid and he's willing to compete. And again, like this is a little detail, like they're, they're filming the pro day. You could watch it, but you can't hear that little detail of like them going at it and just seeing that competitiveness from him, which was cool because, you know, I saw him, uh, you know, two weeks ago at the Jersey event and he only played the first half because uh, early in the second half, he attacked the hoop and sprained his ankle. But in that first half offensively, I think he missed one shot. Like he probably had like, 15, 17 points, something like that. He was knocking down threes off the bounce. He was getting in the lane. He was finishing mid-air body contortion, smooth. Like, I have no questions about his offensive potential at all. I think he's going to be able – he's your consummate, you know, rangy scoring wing, you know. But the defensive stuff and the competitiveness, like, that's the stuff that I thought was really cool to see from him in person because, look, if you could score in this league and that's cool and everybody wants that, Everybody needs that, but you're going to get to a certain level and eventually everyone's going to be like, okay, but can you guard? Cause if you can't guard, you're not a playoff guy. And I saw signs of him just from a competitive standpoint where I was like, he could be a playoff, a legit playoff guy one day as one of the main guys on a team. Nick half. What did you think of, of Tiller and Cunningham? I don't like when you're quiet, so I got to <laughs> throw you on the spot sometimes. No, that, that, but I, I much prefer Corey's Intel no, here. Corey, no, this I has mean, been I'm ready um, to run through a wall right now. Thank you, Corey. We'll send you no, a trip. <laughs> thank you, Nas. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Nas. I, I with, with Tiller. I I I didn't. Ha I, I had the rosters and stuff pulled up, but like not on the window because I was watching it. And then you know he knocks down a corner three. Uh, they zoom in on him. The veins in his biceps are popping. I'm like, all right, whose dad is out here? Um, you know he's getting a couple offensive rebounds, hitting. Why is Ryan Gomes was... on the floor? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Who right. gave Gomes a jersey? By uh, the way, yeah. drenched, drenched, doing drills with them, Gomes? working harder than anybody, That's drenched. Awesome. Boston Celtic legend. Everybody knows. And Minnesota Timberwolf legend. Everybody knows. Everyone knows that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but with Tilly, then you know, he grabs some really nice defensive rebounds, makes some nice rotations, playing defense, hits some mid-range turnarounds. I'm like, all right, who the fuck is this kid? You know, put like actually click on his name, graduation year, 2026. I'm like, what the fuck? And it was just like, this, this kid can't drive yet. And he looks like an NBA player. Like, what is happening? And it's like, okay, well, all right, he's going to just live in my brain rent free now for the next four years. That's really exciting. Um, and then Nas Cunningham is just like, God, just everything is fluid and 
effortless and it's like god like the the ceiling for this kid if you know he really locks in everything and it becomes more consistent and there's just so much for him to work with on both ends of the floor where it's like just his upside and potential is scary so i it, it was impossible to come away not incredibly impressed with both of those guys individually but then just all of the uh, the young talent that OTE brought in this year, because it's just, it's really, really impressive and so much deeper than what they had last year. So we're potentially going to have a draft with Bryson Tiller, Cooper flag and Cameron Boozer. Correct. Woo. Hey, I'm just letting you know right now. Let us know. I'm taking, I'm taking Tiller over flag. I know we're years away, but oh man. <laughs> and I get it. I like it. The, the defense, the length, maybe the shooting comes around. He's impacting guys. He's at Montford. He's going to have, you know, he's going to develop in a really good spot too. Yeah. Bryson Tiller. No, oh, I, man. <laughs> I'm just saying that's a <laughs> gauntlet. <laughs> you gauntlet get a top of a draft. Three. Just we're get a top three fun. pick. You know, that's going to be a, a heck of a draft. But Tiller, I, I was just like, drooling after watching that because i was like my goodness you know the the upside he has and he looks like he's got great character the intangibles sound like they're going to be through the roof the foundation already as a 16 year old looks awesome but when i watched nas cunningham moving on the floor offensively and getting his shot and stuff i was like this dude this looks like poetry in motion like it is artwork with how smooth he is and hearing you talk about his previous experience when you saw him um live before it, it just looked like he, he could be a damn nightmare at the next level if everything comes together. Cause his frame, it looks smooth. It just looks like he needs to fill out. Like he, he yeah. doesn't look like it's awkward, like size and he's still learning. It looks like he's just like, he can cover a lot of ground very quickly. He can create separation and it's just maturing and letting that frame build out. All right. Well, Corey, are, is there are there any names that we didn't get to? Uh, final thoughts, things I just forgot to ask um, with the, the the overtime elite pro day. Um, I, I think you know just some other guys that I would add to the radar. Um, Bryson Warren, who is going to be playing with Nas Cunningham. Um, he's class of twenty twenty four, six th- six foot three inch guard. He's one of the best shooters in the program. Um, He's impressed me both times I watched him. I also saw him make some really impressive reads as a passer. Um, Cannot Carlisle, I, I think he's go, yeah. he's a he's committed to Stanford. Yes. Um, he is a, a 2024 guy as well, so he'll be on the radar soon. I think you know he's pretty impressive. Um, he's a really impressive shooter. Like he is, he can get hot real quick and just absolutely scorch you. Um, and he just a beautiful shot, high arcing, gets off the ground. He's somebody to keep an eye on. Um, Tyler Smith is another Thank guy. You. I've been waiting. I was like, what did he do to you? Yeah, Tyler Smith is impressive. He's 6'10", class 2024, lefty, um, athletic, fluid. Another guy to keep on the, the, the radar. I, I think those are the main guys. There, there are guys that... Um, you know, I, I think are going to develop in the program that are going to work their way up into these, the same conversation eventually. But those are the guys that I, I think I was most impressed with the last couple of weeks from the games up and through the pro day. Rucker, what about you? Any, anyone stand out that we didn't mention? No, I, I was just intrigued with Tyler Smith, but it wasn't, you know, all due respect. It wasn't the level of these other guys, but watching those, I was like, who's this little lefty? This looks a little intriguing. And, 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 um, Tyler Smith, someone that I wrote down. I was like, okay, keep an eye on this. Like, but I thought everyone we talked about was pretty much hitting hitting right on the spot. You know, I'm just I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Corey, for jumping on. You know, well, the you know. first episode on the No Ceilings feed, we get Corey back to back. You know, you usually got to pay double for that type of treatment. I mean, <laughs> little you know, I was in Atlanta. You know, little little Magic City. Yeah. You know. <laughs> treated you well gift. apparently <laughs> is it suspended for a year from magic City? <laughs> well Corey, th- th- this was awesome intel thank you so much uh please tell the people where they can find you 
Well, obviously, you could find me on the uh, No Ceilings NBA Draft podcast feed. Uh, I am there on Thursdays with the Draft Act podcast with Albert. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Corey Tulliba, on TikTok, NBA Draft Dude, at TikTok, uh, No Ceilings NBA, um, on YouTube, NBA Draft Dude, and then obviously at NoCeilingsNBA.com. I think I'm also going to be doing a um, you know a, a collaboration piece with Steven, who was along for the ride with me at the Pro Day for my piece on Wednesday, I think is when uh, when I'm up up to the plate. So I think we're going to do a, a collaborative piece on this experience. So, you know, I'll probably throw in some clips and, you know, which will help uh, elaborate a little bit on some of the stuff that we talked about here. It'll be a nice companion piece to, you know, this conversation. Well, everyone, make sure to go check that out. Rucker, plug away. Um, I'll keep it short and sweet because just, you know, Corey is a great guy. Um, I'm at Tyler underscore Rucker on all social medias. Find me at noceilingsmba.com. I now have a TikTok because, you know, everyone knows I just love TikTok these days. So, um, but it's not basketball stuff. It's, it's like dances and stuff. (laughs) Yeah. It's weird stuff. No, I haven't posted anything yet. So the anticipation builds, the suspense (laughs) is terrible. Um, but this has been a real treat, Corey. Thanks for coming on. And yeah, no ceilings, If you haven't get our preseason draft guide, it's five bucks. It's way, it's a steal, absolute steal. You get way more bang for your buck. So, Thank you guys for, for doing and, this. And I just, you know, I want to say I, I did it yesterday, but I want to shout out um, Kevin O'Connor from the Kevin. Rigor. And I want to shout out the guys from Through the Wire, Pee Wee yes, Plug, uh, specifically for, you know, they gave us um, a lot of love for the preseason draft guide. And, you know, those guys extending their platforms to, you know, on without us having to, you know, ask them and berate them for it just out of, the, the kindness of their heart was, you know, it's a very cool thing for, for those guys to do. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and they're guys who know their stuff too. So they, they wouldn't just say it to say it. Uh, so, and the, their endorsement means the world. Um, so everyone make sure to please go check out our preseason draft guide at no ceilings, NBA.com. Um, we also have new merch up. Um, you can either go to no ceilings, NBA.com and go through the link to the store there, or go directly to no ceilings, NBA.bigcartel.com. You can follow us across all socials at no ceilings, NBA and on YouTube at no ceilings TV. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to subscribe, leave a review and a five-star rating until next time. See ya.